Lord, I thank you so much um, for Carl, for the anointing that is on his life. I thank you so much that in, in this today, you, you united our hearts, you united our excitement, our passion for you, for what you've done, Lord, for the depth of what it means, Lord, that we that we just grow and grow and grow in you. And the more we, we walk with you, the more we understand there's so much more than just praying the sinner's prayer. And Lord, I feel like you're just now seriously showing us what it meant back then when we all prayed that sinner's prayer. And Lord, I pray that you, that you come now, that you open our eyes, the eyes of our understanding, that you would open the ears, that we would understand what, what you have to say. And Lord, please speak through me and, and help me in my weakness, Lord. I'm very tired and, and Carl just messed me up and I, I'm just going to rely on your grace, Lord. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> So, yeah, I just wanted to uh, start out by by giving a, a brief overview over the the classical way of what the atonement uh, was, uh, how that was described from theologians. Since I also wrote a paper on the atonement, so there's basically uh, three main schools of thought, and they go along with church history. So the first view of the atonement is what is called the classical view. There's also two other names for it, which is called the ransom theory or uh, Christus Victor theory. And that really was the, the teaching of the church, like from the early days on for about a thousand years or so. Uh, the church was just preaching this and stating that Christ was uh, the one that liberated us from sin by giving himself as a ransom. And, and uh, secondly, also that he, that he achieved a victory over Satan and uh, that he exchanged his life for ours. And, and, and Carl was already touching on that uh, when he mentioned that we have now Christ's DNA. And I, I truly believe that. And uh, f- from the way that I see that atonement is a process that, 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 span, uh, that pans out uh, over the period of time between us first giving our lives to the Lord to the day where we receive our new uh, resurrection body, which really is the fulfillment of the atonement, uh, the, the completion of it. So all that time in between, and we're all in that time in between right now, is a process and a development to that. And we do have that spiritual DNA now, but we will also have his physical DNA, that resurrection body eventually. So th- that's, that's just a thought on, on what um, Carl was sharing as well. And um, <clears throat> so around the 11th century, there were, was a new school, a school of thought that came up in, in theology, which is called uh, scholasticism. I hope I pronounced it right in English. Uh, and uh, so they came up with a slightly different view of the atonement, and that, that is called the satisfaction theory. And um, that was brought up by uh, Anselm of Canterbury in, in the UK, or well, England at the time. And uh, he was more coming like from the point of God being a righteous and sovereign ruler that uh, needed, that because he was so righteous, his, his um, requirement of righteousness that we couldn't fulfill was fulfilled by Christ for him. And so Christ stepped in and satisfied the need for upholding the Father's position on the throne, being totally merciful and totally righteous at the same time, which when you think, think it through is, is a contradiction when sin comes into play. And then um, in more recent times, about the last hundred years or so, there is also another uh, point of view of what the atonement is that's called the, the humanistic view. Um, and um, that is more like it's more about you know changing us into better beings. Christ came to change us, to improve on us, so we we become better people. We we have uh, you know the the the, the self help gospel that type of thing, and that over time drifted off in a let's say non not so cross-centered uh, theology that is pretty prevalent uh, in our day and age where, where people are just using Christ or Jesus to, 
to help them in their situation, to fix their problems, to make them a little better people and all that. And that's a big reason why the gospel is so weak uh, today. So in my paper, I actually developed a fourth, a, a new uh, approach. And that's really uh, so amazing. Like uh, when Carl was sharing, um, you, you guys all saw how at the end, the, the sun was shining through the window and just crossing all over his shoulder and was shining right into camera. We could sometimes not even see Carl because the sunlight was so bright. So that is actually an illustration of what I'm trying to say. And I'm so glad that the Lord actually gave us that illustration because it may be at first a little difficult to understand what, what I'm trying to say. So my point of view of what the atonement is, I call it the restoration of light. And um, so I believe that is the actual uh, original Hebrew point of view. And um, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm proposing is that in that in that one scripture that uh, Carl also was uh, elaborating a lot, Genesis three twenty one, where um, God first provides the um, the first uh, solution for for the sin of man. Uh, I see a lot of things. I'm just going to read that verse. It says there, verse twenty one in Genesis three. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So, obviously, they had tried to make the fig leaves themselves before, but they, they, have lived, they lived in the garden for years without any sort of clothing. So, absolutely, I agree with Carl. This was not for, for the sake of a clothing in the sense of a shirt and, and pants and shoes and or whatnot, but this was a replacement for something that mankind lost at the moment of sin. And um, so here's what I'm proposing. I, and I, I feel like the whole gospel is in that one verse. Uh, so I'm saying, I, I'm, my statement is Adam and Eve were covered with something before the fall. That covering was lost through the entrance of sin into their lives. They realized that, suddenly try to pull the fig leaves over their bodies. That is the human attempt to fix the problem, which is condemned to fail because obviously they still struggle with guilt, even though the fig leaves are all over them. But remember, Cobb was talking a lot about the shedding of blood, and there was no shedding of blood by picking leaves from a tree, right? So it's the same thing with, with Cain and Abel. You know, the one of them shed blood the other one did not shed blood in, in their sacrifice and again here adam and eve the first thing they do did not involve the shedding of blood so that is basically the first uh, miniature picture of what religion is all about we realize there's something wrong and we try to fix it that's really religion and then there is uh the next step is that god comes along and he has the solution for the problem. He's not surprised by, by sin and its effects, but he has a covering that is appropriate. He takes a skin from an animal. We don't know which animal it was, but of course, if you take a skin from an animal, you have to kill it. And that is the true definition of the gospel. Someone has to die for us or else we would have to die. So... Um, let me continue here. It's kind of like interesting. Yeah. So Carl, you, you touched already on those, uh, on those main types of the sacrifice. And I really don't want to repeat, uh, what you said, because I thought it was awesome. You went into great detail and, and all, all the, 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 the symbolism in there. So one of the things maybe that I can add to that, I, I just tried to identify what these offerings in the Old Covenant, what they would represent for us as New Covenant believers, and how that would tie into the whole concept of atonement, which I, I felt like was like an umbrella term, like a you know covering of a lot of things that breaks down into those different sacrificial special sacrifices so i when i looked at the at the wave offering for example uh where they swing the the offering in front of god that uh, reminded me of the acts of worship that we um 
delivered to God in the new covenant. Then there's the heath offering where, where they lift things up towards God. And uh, to me, that speaks of acts of service. When we, uh, when we serve God, not because uh, we want to receive forgiveness of sin through that, but because we serve him out of love and, and as a sign of our gratefulness. And then, of course, you already uh, talked about that. The sin offering is, is obviously a complete um, a type of what Christ did on the cross, God removing our sin. Then also the burnt offering, speaking about that as well, but also again, uh, touching on 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 worship in the in the fuller sense, in, in the sense of adoring God, devo- devoting our lives to Him, uh, dedicating um, certain things to God over time. Hopefully, more and more areas of our lives, su- supplication, and, and um, things like that. So way more than you know, just singing songs or, or playing an instrument. And then also there's another offering. I'm not sure you touched on that, but it's also more part of some of the other offerings. It's the meal and grain offering where, where there's actually no uh, blood involved in that. So it is still considered part of the sacrificial system, even though no blood is shed. So to me, that's, that speaks also of, of honoring God with our friendship, with acts of homage, with um, um, uh, just, just giving. You know, in the New Testament, we, we have that opportunity to give to the church, to give to the poor, and, and all of that. So um, let me just go to something else that I thought was unique. And I don't know if this is going to work. I tried it earlier and it did work. So I'm just going to try to share my screen with all of you. And hopefully you can give me some feedback whether that works or not. So... Can you give me a sign if you can see that star software? Okay, is it clearly visible? Yeah, so uh, Carl already mentioned it again, that there were four main animals in the uh, uh, sacrificial system, and they all point to to Christ and what he did on the cross in in four different ways. And uh, I don't know who said that first, and uh, I just base it on, on the scripture where uh, Paul talks in Romans 1.20, he talks about uh, the creation, uh, the creation being the second book of God. And to me, the stars is obviously over 99% of creation. <laughs> so, um, and I love the stars, and they also tie back right into this uh, statement that I made in the beginning about uh, the atonement being the restoration of light. So when you look at the screen, you see all kinds of light and you also see symbols. So I'm going to move this around. So here's the first animal in that sacrificial system that speaks of the atonement. And uh, this is is an ox or a bull. It's also called Taurus uh, in in the zodiac. So you probably know it from there. So when you look at this animal here, the way it is described in the stars, it, it looks kind of funny, right? It looks like this ox comes out of a that there's a wall and it comes out of something or in other words it's just half an ox it's just the front half it's the the head the horns and the two front feet there's no back feet there's no tail there's no stomach all that is not there and and that is a a reminder of genesis 15 where where god made that great covenant with with abraham of which we are now part uh, in the new covenant that uh, God took the animals into house. And I think we had that discussion in this class too, that this is um, how, how the ancients made covenants, that the animals were halved and the, the partners of the covenant were just walking through it. And that is actually expressed here in the stars, which is totally amazing to me. I just saw that when I prepared for this presentation. So that is the first animal that is in the stars. And then, Right underneath here, you see the second animal. Uh, hope, hopefully, you can see it. I'm try, just going to try to enlarge it. This is 
what in the zodiac is called Aries or the lamb. And you can't see it in this illustration. That's why I'm trying to get an, a, an artist to make me some new illustrations. It is actually a lamb slain. It is a wounded lamb. It's not, it's not a healthy lamb. It's a, a lamb that is being sacrificed. And <clears throat> of course, that speaks of Jesus being the, the, the Passover lamb for us as well. And now I have to jump um, through the sky a little bit. So here's the third animal. And that is also speaking of the atonement and also of the sacrifice. You see here, this is the constellation called uh, Capricorn. It's also part of the 12 zodiac signs. It's actually a goat. You see here on the right-hand side, it's a goat. On the left-hand side, it's actually the tail of a fish. And the way how the, the ancients, uh, such as Enoch and, and, and Sam and, and Noah were interpreting this sign was that this goat again speaks of of the sacrifice and the sacrifice becomes a blessing to the other part which is expressed with the fish tail the fishes prominently speak of the believers like it, you know we're called to be fishers of man and there's also the, the the constellation of pisces the fishes also speaks of the believers of the the large numbers of believers coming in through the sacrifice of jesus so here you see that combination you see the sacrifice and, and and the ones that are being blessed by the sacrifice, the, the, the fish. <laughs> so, and then there's the last one that I wanted to show, the last animal. And uh, Carl mentioned that. I hope you can see that here. Yeah, that is the dove. And uh, the dove is such an amazing animal. It was used for, by the poor people. Um, they couldn't afford a more expensive animal, it was cheaper than the others for the sacrifice. But uh, the dove here is, is so amazing in, in that when you look to the right, I'm just going to zoom over to the right here. There's actually a connection in the story, how it is told in the stars between the dove and then over here to this constellation, with, which is called the sea monster. And uh, so it really plays several different roles here. You've got um, the story of Jonah and the fish. So Jonah in Hebrew means the dove, right? I think we had that when we looked at the book of Jonah. This dove is headed towards the sea monster, the, the fish that was swallowing up him up. So this is telling us the story of Jonah. And uh, it also is telling us the story of Jesus because, you know, it, we often say, oh, the dove speaks of the Holy Spirit. And it does because the dove came down on Jesus on the day of his baptism as a sign that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and, and baptized in the Spirit. But it's also, a sign, it's also a type of Jesus because the dove was also sacrificed for, for the sin of the, of the poor. And uh, so here you see the dove flying right straight over to the sea monster, which is a, a picture of Leviathan, of, of the enemy, the dragon. All these things come, come into play. So Jesus gave himself up to, over to the devil uh, so, so that we don't have to do that. And, he, and we, he received the punishment on the cross. He received the beating and the th crown of thorns and all of that. So that, that is uh, like the story that I wanted to share from the stars. And um, now that I'm talking about all these animals, um, I think, Carl, you mentioned that too. There is a, a key scripture in the, in the New Testament, Hebrews 10, 4, uh, where it says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away our sin. And... Uh, we think, wow, this is a New Testament concept because all oh, these animals is all Old Testament and then we have Jesus in the New Testament. And that is true on first look. But I found like so many scriptures that talk about the fact that the sacrifice of animals is not enough, not only in the time of David, so even in the time of Moses. And I just wanted to read some of that because I, I have a passion, that the same passion that the apostles had, and that is preaching from the Old Testament and describing New Testament principles from it. So 
you know, when you read Paul, he, he quotes from Psalms, he, he quotes from Moses, he quotes from Habakkuk, whatever, and then he explains the New Testament truths from it. And, and in the same way, I want to do that here. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, 43 says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries. He, meaning God, will provide atonement for his land and for his people. So this is so amazing to me that not only does it talk about the fact that God is the one who has to provide the atonement, but that the atonement is not only for the Jews, which we think that's what the Old Testament teaches, which is not true. The Old Testament really teaches both. The atonement is for Jew and Gentile. It says, rejoice Gentiles with his people Israel. So th this, is, this is truly amazing. And then from, from David in Psalm 65, 3, it says, iniquity, iniquity prevails against me. And as for my transgressions, O Lord, you are the one who provides atonement for them. And again, in Psalm 79, 9, help us, O God. You are the God of our salvation for the glory of your name and deliver us and provide atonement for our sins for your name's sake. So there is someone praying there that, that knows that those millions of animals being slaughtered are not doing the job. And uh, one last one from Ezekiel, Ezekiel 16, 63, that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your shame. Uh, in that day when I provide you an atonement for all that you have done, says the Lord God. So that's, that's all Old Testament, but it's all New Testament truth. So I, I'm always excited when I, when I find all of this. And, and the New Testament is, almost, is, is, is mainly a midrash, which is Hebrew meaning a commentary uh, on the Old Testament. And that's how I believe we, we need to evangelize Jews. And I don't know even why I say that right now, but I just feel like it's so important to be relatable to the Jews as Gentile believers and not just have this church uh, church mindset but that full full gospel jew gentile uh, united mindset so maybe just to complete this i just want to briefly touch on one thing um there's this scripture in colossians 2 16 and 17 and i don't have it in front of me but i'm just quoting it by heart right now there's paul talking about no one should judge you for food or for drink, for festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths, because they are all only shadows of the true thing, and that true thing is Christ. So he, he basically says, if you study everything that Moses says about food and drink and, and uh, the, the festivals, the new moon festival and the Sabbath, all of that all talks about Christ. And I think he's just giving examples that would be a whole lot more. So one of the things that truly relates to the atonement is obviously that one feast, that sixth feast out of the seven main feasts that are mentioned in Leviticus 23, and that is the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And I just want to uh, share with you briefly what happened on that day. Uh, it was one day in the calendar, Tishri the 10th, uh, excuse me. Um, yeah, no, it was Tishri the 10th. And uh, it was that highest day of vacation. That was the only day where people were absolutely not allowed to work. And they were actually, you know, in the other feast days, people were told not to work. But if they were were to work, they could, you know, receive forgiveness. But on the Day of Atonement, if you worked, you were killed because you would miss the most important thing in the entire year. And that was obviously the atonement. And so what happened on that day was that the, the high priest, and in the beginning that was Aaron, let me just say Aaron for, for argument's sake, um, and everything that I'm describing now, most of that is actually from Leviticus chapter 16. So Aaron always wore that big ephod, that blue and red and gold, big dress. He had a fancy turban. He had that golden plate uh, with the 12 stones that he carried. He had that. Uh, he had a belt, very nice, also with ornaments and, and uh, embroideries and everything. So 
the thing that he had to do on that day was that before he could start anything else, he had to take off all of these clothes, all of his glory, everything that meant him, his identity, his high priesthood. He laid everything down. He dressed himself naked. And I don't know how that looked like in front of the entire nation, but that's what happened. He took off his entire clothes. He probably had some sort of an underwear, I, I assume, but I don't know. So, and then he had to put on an entirely new set of clothes, which was uh, also like a robe and a, and a belt and a, and a turban. And it was all made out of pure white linen. And that, that is actually a type of uh, a Revelation 19, where it talks about Jesus being dressed in white and the armies of heaven coming with him, all on white horses. They're all dressed in white. And then it also talks about how his white robe is dipped in blood. And that is the next thing that happens because now that Aaron or the high priest is completely dressed in white, he has to dip every, he has to perform sacrifices. And you do that completely dressed in white where you see every single stain you could see. And that was the purpose of, of wearing that. So uh, that the blood would be seen and, and the necessity of that. But also the white, of course, speaks of the righteousness that comes through that sacrifice. So what he did is he confessed the sins uh, of himself, of his family, of, of the nation, and he performed different sacrifices, again, involving uh, a bull and um, two uh, goats and a lamb. I don't think there was a, a dove involved for right at the top of my head right now, but he, 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 he chose those three. And this is a total illustration of what we read in Matthew 25, 31 to 45, where it talks about the judgment between the goat and the sheep. And we can only understand what Matthew is talking about if we understand that, that what happened on that day. So Aaron would put his hands on one of the goats and confess the sins of the nation. And then he would send that that goat out in the desert, he would kick it out of the camp. And that is an allusion to where it talks about Jesus died outside of the camp. So that goat speaks of Jesus. And uh, it, it, um, it is then also accompanied by a, by a priest, by a young uh, descendant of the priestly uh, lineage, who makes sure that the goat never comes back in the camp, but actually is brought to a certain rock that is out in the desert uh, at the time when they first started uh, the celebrations. And uh, no, sorry, that is the rock is near uh, Jerusalem. And uh, that young high priestly um, person makes sure that that goat actually eventually falls off of that cliff. And uh, this again talks about uh, the enemy. Uh, the um, Satan uh, being thrown in the bottomless pit at the end of time, which Revelation at the end talks about. And uh, so there's so many things involved. Christ's uh, sacrifice for us, the redemption, the white clothes, and then also what it means to the devil that comes into that bottomless pit. And then there is that second um, part where there is the, the sheep, Remember, Matthew 25 talks about goat and sheep. So eventually the goat ends up being the one being thrown down off the cliff. So that's the bad guys. And then you got the good guys, the sheep. So the sheep ends up becoming a burned offering on the Day of Atonement. And the, and the burned offering, as I mentioned earlier, is that type of complete devotion. So the people that are considered the good ones, the ones that the Lord is pleased with on, on the day of that judgment are the ones that fully devoted themselves to him. They took care of his brothers and they took care of the poor and they didn't just serve lip service, but they actually did the talk. So, so and uh, there, there's more to this ceremony, but uh, we can talk about that maybe another time. Just let me restate um, that that uh, that um, uh, how would I say that uh, my my original thought through all of what Jesus did, he restored that light that covered Adam and Eve, and with that, 
also will restore that light that will cover us moving forward so that we shine like a light, a city on a hilltop. And that is exactly my point. So we become like the father of lights because we're his children. We're the children of light and we are beings of light. And so is the Lord. And that is our eternal future. Thank you.